Hello, this is a prepaid call from Kimberly Boone, an inmate at a Florida Department of Corrections institution. My husband was my best friend. We never fought, argued. We got along. Great. Covering Seminole County, testimony is underway in the trial of a woman accused of trying to kill her husband twice. So I was feeling a little bit groggy, had a headache, a little bit disoriented. Could someone potentially set fire to a property and leave no trace of doing that? Yes. Hello and welcome back to One Minute Remaining. My name is Jack Lawrence, the host and creator of this show. This is part five of my chat with Kimberly Boone, the mother of two serving over 30 years in jail for arson and the premeditated attempted murder of her husband, a crime she has always maintained she's innocent of. Now, obviously, seeing as this is part five, if you've not heard the other four parts, probably best to hit that pause button right now, jump on back and catch up. So in the previous episode, I mentioned that while doing these interviews, I, of course, do my own independent research about these cases. Some I'm able to find plenty of information on. Others, I'm quite limited. And some, I have to solely rely on the information from the men and women who I speak with. Being from outside of the US makes it quite difficult to get my hands on trial material. So I'm very reliant on what I can find online. While doing some more extensive research on Kim's case, I came across some evidence and testimony that I was previously unaware of. So I needed to ask Kim about it. As I'll be honest, some of it was bothering me. Now, the reason I wanted to talk to you while editing the episode, your episode, obviously I find bits and pieces as I'm sort of trawling through the internet and I do have to uh, ask the question because it pops up. Okay. So while looking around online, I came across a very short clip of Kim's initial trial for the shooting. In this clip, they played a small portion of the original 911 call that Kim made to the police after shooting her husband. And I'm going to be honest, this sounds odd, and it's not something Kim had previously mentioned to me. Uh, Somebody was back in my house and my husband was shot. Your husband was shot? Yes, he's laying here. Hurry, please hurry. He went out the front door. I did not shoot you. Well, I did not shoot you, sweetheart. I was in with the boys. So I asked her about it. Uh, the nine one one call, the original nine one one call after the shooting of your husband. Now, in court, they played a recording or, or part of the recording of the nine one one call, and they made a big deal about this actually in the media, which is how, which is sort of how I stumbled across it. Kimberly Boone's husband was officially announced as a witness in her attempted murder case. She's accused of shooting him in the family garage, then calling 911 to say, uh, Somebody was back in my house and my husband was shot. But the suspicion starts later in that same call, when her husband is heard a short distance away. Well, I did not shoot you, sweetheart. I was in with the boys. Expect that 911 call and the testimony from her husband to be key evidence in the case. And they played the call, and it said in the call that you were saying that um, my husband was shot by an intruder. So this is where they're saying that you, right. when you called 911, you initially lied about shooting your husband. You told, your, you told the 911 caller it was an intruder that shot your husband. And then they say in the background, you can hear your husband saying, you shot me, you shot me. And then uh, you saying on the phone, I didn't shoot you, sweetheart. I didn't shoot you. Yeah, I don't, I can't honestly tell you. It's been quite so many years oh, now. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. I don't recall exactly. Um, yeah. And I don't know that it, since... Since court, I don't think I've heard, I know I haven't heard the 911 call. So I just, I know that the part that I remembered was him saying, my wife accidentally shot me. Um, I can't, I can't affirm or deny that I said an intruder. Um, it was a little confusing right mm-hmm. after everything happened. And, um, and actually, I think I told you before that when I first was trying to remember what happened, I, I had to really sit and think about it because I guess yeah. you go through a period of kind of like stock. Um, and I, I w- couldn't really remember. So I may have said that. I don't recall um, exactly the way it went, mm-hmm. you know, this many years later. 
Now, of course, this is kind of irrelevant in the scheme of things as the jury heard the entire 911 call in that case and other evidence and found her, of course, not guilty. But I still wanted to make sure we covered this off with Kim. Moving forward now to the arson and attempted murder trial. One thing I was initially unaware of while researching this story was testimony from an apparent computer expert. He'd said that on the computer in the home he had found searches for how do house fires start, how much Xanax is too much, and what do fire marshals look for. In late afternoon testimony, a computer expert said Kimberly Boone had searched for how house fires start and how much Xanax is too much. He also states that these searches were done from a login with the name Kim. So again, I asked him about it. When the state presented him as a witness, they tried to say that the computer was named Kim and that it was password protected and I was the only one that was able to use that. Um, what, when he was testifying, you know, it just didn't, it wasn't true. So I told my attorney, you know, a certain line of questioning to go and um, he asked him, he said, so there's a password assigned to this computer and he said, yes, there is. And he said, is it activated? And he said, well, no, it's not. So, you know, and he said, well, can you explain what that means? And he says, well, anyone in the household could have used the computer at any time. Just because the computer is named Kim, it's going to come up, you know, as searches done, you know, by Kim. Because I was the only, you know, that's the only name that the computer had associated with it. Anybody could have logged on that even though a password was assigned to it, it was inactivated. You didn't need to enter that information to get on there. So what they were trying to say was that, I was the only one that could possibly have done these searches because part of my defense was, you know, Rob had these, this Xanax in his system and I had a legal prescription for it. I had really bad panic disorder. I've had it since I was about 20 years old. Yeah. Um, and I only get panic attacks really bad when I'm driving and driving in an unfamiliar area. So um, I went to the doctor every month and I got a prescription for just exactly enough for, to take uh, the prescribed amount you know, each day right before I drove to work and right before I drove home. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize at the time that Xanax was even a street drug. I knew and didn't know anything about that. Um, and the reason the attempted murder came up was because of Xanax in Rob's system. And what they were trying to say was, I obviously, that I crushed up Xanax, put it in a glass of water, and had him drink that. My attorney had a different theory, is that if he were trying to make it look like, or, you know, maybe he didn't even do it intentionally, but... He had admitted to the triage nurse when he was taken to the hospital after the fire that he had taken my Xanax on his own. Um, he also later told detectives that, too. But he, you know, made a statement, well, I just didn't do it that day. I didn't take it that day. The big thing was my, my attorney's theory was that he took it, but he didn't know. He didn't want to take too much. And I had taken it for, you know, by that time I had been off and on a Xanax for 20 almost 23 years. So, you know, I knew all about about its effects and, and all of that. So it wasn't something that I would even need to research or look up. Yeah, sure. Um, it was just kind of a part of my way of life because of the panic disorder that I had. Uh, so that was it. But they tried to make it uh, seem to the jurist that I was the only one that possibly could have done that search. And it's because I wanted to poison him or give him Xanax, but I didn't want him to die from the Xanax. I just wanted to put him to sleep. So that's where that came from. Right, okay. Something else that I came across while editing the previous episode were more claims from the Boone's neighbour, the man that helped Mr Boone out of his property when it was on fire. He claimed that he'd seen Kimberly Boone leaving the house minutes before the fire started and loading things into the back of her car. It's interesting because... Uh, this this gentleman, he was our next door neighbor. Yeah. The first trial that he testified in, he testified in the shooting trial as well. The timeline that he stated in the first trial differed greatly from the second trial. The first trial, he stated that he thought Rob was with me because we used to do everything together, and um, he didn't even realize that Rob was home. But he said, you know, after maybe like 15 minutes of me leaving, he saw smoke coming out the window. Um, the second trial during uh, the fire trial, he had changed his timeline to maybe it was just like a minute or two after I left. So there was a big discrepancy in his testimony. Also, what's interesting, I worked um, 
at that time, I was a financial aid manager for Kaplan University, and Adam had lost his job. This was after the fire. We had the fire in December. January, I hired him at my Kaplan University to be a financial aid um, representative. Mm. And you have to go through an intense, because you're dealing with federal money, yeah. you know, grants and loans for students to go to school. So you have to go through an intense six-week training program. And after three weeks, you have a midterm. And if you don't pass the midterm, you have to be fired. Adam did not pass the midterm, and uh, although I had hired him, I also had to fire him right before the shooting happened. And so, you know, he, I just don't think he was the best witness for me because of that, that history. But again, they didn't bring that fact up in, in the trial that he had worked for me and that I had to fire him from his position. Um, they also didn't bring up the discrepancy in the timeline, whereas from the first trial, it was only... I mean, it was about 10 to 15 minutes, he said, and the second time it was uh, only just a minute or two. Right. And um, as far as packing things in the truck, uh, we had, I think I told you that we had gone on a trip like the day before. So we had cleaned out the back of the of the SUV. My kids did karate. They both had these uh, two large karate bags, and they had, you know, their the different, like, weapons and things that they used in their training. So... The only thing that I put back in the vehicle that day that we had taken out was their two karate bags. And um, another thing is we had cameras on the outside of our our house. We had four different cameras Mm. that you could log into via the Internet. So, you know, my attorney also didn't pull that footage. That would have shown exactly. um, It would have shown the amount of time between the fire and when I left, and it would have shown anything that I put in the vehicle we had one that faced out towards the driveway. So that's information that they didn't even put into the trial. As we know, Kim was found guilty by a jury of her peers after just four hours of deliberation. So I asked Kim what happened directly after the verdict. Obviously, unfortunately, you're found guilty uh, after all of this. What does your lawyer say to you? Well, he came to see me the next morning, and he looked at me, and he said, well, I guess I should have put you on the stand. Oh, no. He said, because, you know, my ex-husband, you know, he he made these claims of something that happened, you know, in 1993. You know, he said, you're the only one that could have explained it. Um, he said, I should have put you on the stand. He said, your, um, your story's never faltered. He said, I just, in my experience, it's... You know, unless you're absolutely sure that you're going to lose, you never put your client on the stand. He said, I really thought that we were going to come back with a not guilty verdict. I suppose I can kind of understand that because you'd already beaten the, you know, you'd already come through that shooting case. So I can kind of understand his reasoning behind that. But at any stage during the trial when, you know, your ex-husband's claiming all these things, did you turn to him and say, I need to get up there and I need to, I need to talk? Um, no, actually I didn't. I kind of, you know, I I really, you know, since then I've been a law clerk for seven years now. Since Mm. then I've learned a lot of things, but then I was really ignorant to the law and really naive. And I really trusted my attorney that his advice would be the best advice to follow at that point. Yeah, I can understand that. I mean, I know nothing about the law either. So if if I hire someone who is a professional, then I will take their word for things and and go with what they suggest. So I can completely appreciate that. So what happens then from there? Do you obviously, yeah. you obviously put an appeal in, I would imagine? I did. We put in an appeal. Um, the two items that they focused on was the testimony of my ex-husband, Dennis, um, and my reasonable hypothesis of innocence because, you know, I think I may have explained before when a case in Florida is 100% circumstantial, not only, you know, if I offer other explanations as to how it could have happened, they have to not only prove with evidence that I'm guilty, they have to disprove with evidence uh, and say that it couldn't have happened any other way. So I presented two reasonable hypotheses of innocence. One was Rob could have started the fire. He had means, he had motive, he had opportunity, he had expertise. The other was that it could truly have been an accident. And even fire marshals up on the stands were, were saying we can't tell you how the fire started. So if you can't say how a fire started, how are you going to say someone's guilty of setting it? Yeah. It came back to Nod, and 
the way they didn't offer any kind of opinion, so I couldn't take it to a higher court. It just kind of was dead in the water. So, and so if they deny it, then you, they, you've got no recourse to come back unless they actually give reasons as to why they're denying it. Right, exactly. And they don't have to give you one. Um, the next step is called a post-conviction. Um, and that's where you basically say, you know, I wasn't afforded the, the representation that, that I'm supposed to be afforded, you know, um, I'm promised by the U.S. Constitution is that I'll get fair representation. Um, and so if you feel like your attorney did something he shouldn't have or didn't do something that he should have, those are the, that's the, the motion you bring it up on. Mm. Well, you have two years to file that motion. Um, my attorney actually, the same attorney, uh, told me that he would take care of it. He actually was speaking to a friend of mine because I couldn't call from prison. You cannot make phone calls. So he was not on my... He was not on my approved, approved phone, but so I couldn't, uh, I couldn't call him. So my friend spoke to him during this course of this two years, and he kept saying, yes, I'm preparing a post-conviction, I'm preparing it, I'm preparing it. Um, what happened was, after two years, it, it wasn't prepared, and I couldn't get a hold of him. Um, so I had an additional, the law states that if I hired him to do something and he didn't do it, I have an additional two years to prepare it on my own. So that's what I did, is I prepared this, what I thought was a really good post-conviction, and I submitted it. And this was in 2017. They took me out to have a hearing back in the county that I'm from, and it was a limited evidentiary hearing. It was basically my attorney and the prosecution's office against me. And I'm saying, you know, I had to just testify that, you know, I had, I had um, hired him to do this post-conviction and he failed to do so. So I had a, my friend testify on my behalf because she's the one that actually spoke to him for these two years. Mm. Well, they discounted her testimony. They said it was hearsay and that her testimony had to be stricken and we couldn't use it. And it was not hearsay because it's not like I told her what he told me. She spoke to him firsthand and so she should have been allowed to testify to the court as to what he said. But anyway, they came back and they denied it. They said that because of his um, position pretty much in the community, they felt like he was more believable than me. And so they ruled in his favor and they denied my post. So it gets better because what I did was then I appealed the decision to the District um, Court of Appeals. Um, whenever you're indigent, you know, in prison, it does not cost you any type of filing fee and it doesn't cost you to have the record prepared and sent to the appellate court mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what I did is I, is I filed my um, my appeal I got the paperwork back from the appellate court that said it was a post-conviction appeal and that there was no charge within you know a couple of weeks later I got two pieces of paper from the county court one said that I did not pay the hundred dollar filing fee for the notice of appeal, and then another one was trying to charge me two hundred and four dollars for the record because it said indigency paperwork not approved. Well, there's no way that they could not have found me indigent. I had been in prison at that point for what nine years, and I had no, you know, we don't earn money here. I had no money, no assets left, and so I felt like it was a ploy by that same county that convicted me to keep it out of the appellate court because I was at the same time trying to get communication established with my children. So a couple of months before that, I had sent indigency paperwork into the county court and they approved it. So you, you approved me in April, but in August you deny me and say I'm not indigent. So I just felt like it was something else, you know, trying to prevent me, you know, to file this in court. Mm -hmm. So I never got an appeal heard on that. So, as I'm sure you can imagine, getting any ruling overturned is certainly not easy and takes years of paperwork and fighting. Also, courts are not likely to easily overturn a jury's decision, as it's not a good look. The whole American justice system is based on being judged by a, um, a jury of your peers. And the problem with it is if the appellate courts overturn the jurors' decisions all the time, you're basically saying the system does not work, and it doesn't. And the problem with anybody serving on the jury is they don't understand the law. Yeah. So they are, they're, they're left to make these life and death determinations for people 
and they don't even understand what they're making a decision and about. And then they have nothing to do with the sentencing part of it. There's so many people here that the jurist will find them guilty, but later they'll say, I had no idea they were going to get, you know, 30 years in prison or 25 years in prison. They, they don't know mm. the repercussions of, of finding somebody guilty. As we've spoken about many times during Kim's story, the biggest issue here when it comes to a jury trial is just how much publicity both of Kim's cases got in the media and how much they were covered in the news. In fact, in one news report, the journalist states that this jury knew nothing about the first case. Kimberly Boone was already tried once for attempted murder and convinced the jury in that case she thought her husband was an intruder when she shot him. Covering Seminole County testimony is underway in the trial of a woman accused of trying to kill her husband twice. They're saying that Kimberly Boone was an embezzler, that she owed her former boss hundreds of thousands of dollars and that she would do anything to cash in on her husband's insurance policy including trying to kill him. Tough talk between the victim in an attempted murder case and his ex-wife's lawyer. Now, he's the same defense attorney who defended her last year in the other attempted murder case. The state says that Kimberly Boone was basically an embezzler, and they say she was very good at it. Trial for Kimberly Boone just underway in Seminole County, but this trial only covers one of the two counts, the case where she's accused of shooting her husband in the garage then playing it off as a case of mistaken identity. You know, Kimberly Boone stood trial for attempted murder a year ago. Jurors are being asked whether they remember past coverage of this bizarre case. And if so, can they rule with an unbiased mind? Kimberly Boone. Kimberly Boone. Kimberly Boone. Kimberly Boone. Kimberly Boone. Trial for Kimberly Boone. Kimberly Boone. Kimberly Boone. Kimberly Boone. Jurors say Kimberly Boone did it, tried to set her drugged husband on fire. I think we can all safely agree that that's highly unlikely. Kim believes that there is actually one way her case could end up back in court. Yeah, Seminole County, the county I was from is a very, I think I told you, a very small county in Florida and it's predominantly older um, Caucasian uh, couples. And, you know, they're the, they're the, if you look at the demographics, they're the types that, you know, they watch the news, they know what's going on. In their, especially in their own neighborhoods, in their own counties. Um, the neighborhood I lived in, you know, was, uh, uh, I don't know if you've heard of like Lockheed Martin, they're a big defense contractor. It's a lot of their retirees were in that neighborhood. So, you know, I, can't, I find it really hard to believe that these people would never have heard about, you know, a shooting that occurred in that, that neighborhood the way that they sensationalized it in the news. If one of them were to come forward and say, listen, we actually had seen a report or someone mentioned a prior case, then that would actually um, take me back to court and I would get a new trial. Right. They haven't come forward this far, you know, it's been all these many years. So. so with that option seeming rather unlikely, Kim faces the very real future of a life behind bars as she has exhausted all of her appeals. Um, no, I don't. After the appeal um, is the post-conviction, and that's the one I was telling you that yeah. my attorney was supposed to have filed and didn't. And so, um, they really, once you do that, there's really not much left to do. That sounds well, awful, to be honest. <clears throat> <laughs> it is. I guess they had to put rules and laws in place because, you know, there are new people that get sentenced to prison every day, and mm. if the it's the people that have already been in prison for years continuously clog up the court system with motions that nobody else knew has a chance to get anything in. So. Yeah. Still on the topic of the media, even after Kim's conviction, she was still making headlines as phone conversations between her and another woman on trial for a similar conviction made their way into the hands of the media. This is something we haven't spoken about. They made a massive deal out of your um, friendship with a lady who was in prison. Um, I can't remember her name now. Anita Steffi. Yeah, that's right, because the, you guys were had similar, yeah, a- similar charges. Both shot their husbands and formed a bond behind bars. Now, newly released jail recordings show the continued relationship between Anita Smithy and Kimberly Boone. Gal pals behind bars, and tonight we're hearing some of the recorded conversations between two women who shot their husbands. Um, we actually only met when she came in to county jail. That's the first time I had even seen her but we were kind of they called us kindred spirits because we had a similar background she was a professional woman who worked she was 
she had been married and divorced and remarried, and she had, you know, two children of her own and a couple of stepchildren. Mm. Um, and we were close to the same age, so we were, you know, we were similar. Um, a lot of a lot of similarities between us, and I. I was kind of like the mother when people were to come into the county jail. They didn't have uh, warm clothing. And I come, since I had been there for three years, I would collect clothing from people. And when new people would come in, I would distribute it. So it's just, you know, I was kind to her. And we, we struck up a friendship. And um, she had actually had an abusive husband and shot him and killed him. And um, But really, you know, we... I don't know, we just, like I said, we had a lot of the same interests because of our age, and we were born in the same time era, and, you know, our friendship was more about outside interests than than anything that we were going through. Did she um, plead guilty to shooting and killing her husband? No, she pled not guilty. She was out on, like, a bond and an ankle monitor. I only spent, like, a month with her in county jail. Yeah, right. But she remained my friend. I would call her and talk to her. They recorded our phone conversations. They gave me a plea of uh, 30 years uh, for second-degree murder mm. and five years for tampering with evidence. What? Yeah, I'm like, what? So you're trying to say that I injured another person with um, a weapon after the crime was committed, and you're trying to say I stabbed myself? Right. You're going to give me 15 years because you said I stabbed myself? Right. That's what they offered me, 30 years. My first and only offer of 30 years. That was for the um, shooting, and then they never made me an offer for the fire. But she, um, she went to trial, I think, after about five years, and she lost. And she was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Um, and I had already been in prison for five or six years, so they kind of brought my case back to the light. Then, you know, they called us um, the Wives Murder Club, you know, kind of like after a James Patterson book. They tried to sensationalize it and make it like we had some kind of pact to kill our husbands, but we didn't even know each other until, mm. you know, she was arrested. Yeah. Uh, but she ultimately, she, she just got out of prison last year. She won a post-conviction proceeding, went back to court, and they gave her time served and 10 years probation, and she's home now. And she shot her husband. She shot him and killed him, yes. Your husband isn't dead, so, I mean... <laughs> no, he, he's not. He's not. So she, she served about, she's probably served five years out of 40 years, and then, like I said, she's got 10 years probation. But, yeah, it's just a matter of... You know, what I was telling you um, is a matter of getting back in court in front mm. of the judge. And if you have an attorney <clears throat> that helps you, it's a lot easier. A lot of us don't have an advocate to fight for us once we get in here. So with Kim's appeals all exhausted, she looks to spend the rest of her life behind bars. So I wanted to find out exactly what that life looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I was saying yesterday that I kind of live in one of the better places in prison. It's um, called the Incentivized Program, and you have to have been good to get in here. But, you know, I, I have it better than most. I leave and go to work about 7.30 in the morning. I get to stay at work all day, so I don't have to be in the dorm. But for those that aren't in this program, um, you know, they, they're locked in a lot. Uh, they don't get a lot of yard time. Uh, it, Right now, in this prison, there aren't really any educational opportunities for the women. Um, we're always short-staffed. Um, you know, they're insisting that, you know, officers work overtime so many days per week, so they work 16 hours several different days, and they're tired and they're grouchy. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not the best place to be, um, being on the receiving end of you know, you'll get some officers that go, we call it the bubble, it's the officer's station. Mm. And, you know, they'll put up a sign that says closed, you know, closed, leave me alone until noon. And, you know, if you need something, you can't get it. Um, so it's, you know, it's not the best place to be, but, you know, we're not, we're not getting beaten. And we, you know, we get yelled at a lot and they, mm. they talk, um, they talk down to the women a lot. Mm. Um, they're trying to trying to clean it up a little bit, but you know you have officers here with the the old mindset of the way things used to be. Yeah, for someone who has obviously been in prison a long time, and they talk about you know prison being a place to rehabilitate people, would you would you suggest that it, it is a place where people can get rehabilitated or not? Not in Florida, no, absolutely not. Um, especially not in a women's prison. And the problem with a lot of the mindset is, you know. Um, 
it's that a lot of these women will be getting out and they're going to be someone's neighbor someday and they kind of warehouse women they put you in a dorm and there are 86 beds in here so you're in here with 85 other women in a room that oh god i don't even know how big it is but you know you don't have a lot of space there's always somebody looking at you um and then with no no classes and nothing to do it leaves a lot of idle time for a lot of people you know a lot of people get into trouble they do mischief Mm -hmm. unless you can find something productive to do and there's just not a lot of jobs for people yeah and it doesn't really matter they get we don't get paid for our jobs um so somebody can lay around and sleep and and get the same uh 15 percent off of their sentence that somebody that works all day long so there's really no incentive to work not really no it's really not. So is your main job um, being the, the law clerk or is, do you do something else? No, I, I'm a law clerk, yes. I yeah. do that all day long. I mean, I would imagine that keeps That's you pretty for busy. seven years. It keeps me very busy for, you know, everybody wants to get out of prison for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, can, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, it's strange, very strange that. <laughs> <laughs> but, right. But my, my job never ends. I got people stopping me on the, you know, we call it the center walk when we're going to chow or coming back to the dorm and, they're in the dorm. Kim, I need your help. I need your help. And so, you know, you kind of have to have a lot of patience to do that job. Yeah, because I'm, yeah, I'm sure you're getting, uh, yeah, I would imagine because people think that they obviously they want their, their stuff done first and it's all important and needs to be done as quickly as possible. So yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of people that, exactly. um, that are constantly on at you. Yes, and we're, we're under a lot of deadlines for things you know like i told you with the courts people have certain deadlines and sometimes they wait until the last minute to come in and it's their responsibility to to really get the stuff in before their deadline but you know if you're somebody like like i am that really care about people and care you know sometimes i feel like i care about people's cases more than they do right you know they get here and they get caught up they get caught up in prison life and they just kind of keep putting it off they're getting tired of being disappointed by denials from the court and they just kind of give up and they don't really have anything to look forward to yeah well look i mean i think it's fantastic what you do you know obviously someone in your situation could just decide that you know whatever i i I don't i can't be bothered i'm just going to sit here and you know um just sort of give up i suppose but you haven't you've sort of focused yourself on helping others which is um very commendable thank you that i've always wanted to do you've always wanted to get involved with the law uh, well, since I was here, it just always seemed like, you know, and when I saw what kind of a deal I got, I knew that I wasn't the only one. And when I started, you know, getting into these cases and helping people, I realized that there are a lot of people that get a lot of raw deals and somebody needs to help them. So as we wrap up Kim's story for now, I reflect back on what we've spoken about so far. The one thing that's bothered me about this particular case I'll be honest, there's a few things that bother me about this particular case. But the one thing that hit me hardest was Kim and her children. As I've said in the past, I'm a man with two young children. Two children around the same age as Kim's kids were when she was first arrested. Two children that Kim has not seen or spoken to in 14 years. So I asked Kim if she had a message for her children in case, for whatever reason, they happen upon this podcast and decide to listen, is there something she wants them to know? Absolutely. It's that I have, you know, I tried for many years to get contact with them. Um, and as I became, we got older, you know, I, I kind of gave up on that. But I would want them to know that I think about them every day. I love them. Uh, I would like for an opportunity, you know, just to be able to give another side of the story. I don't know what they've been told. It doesn't really matter to me. I just would like to reconnect from where we are right now and the past doesn't matter. I just, you know, would like for them to give me that chance and that, you know, I love them more than life itself. And I would hope that they would want to, you know, just get to know me as who I am. You have one minute remaining. All is not completely lost for Kim. She does say that if she can get a lawyer on her side, there are a few things that they would be able to do to potentially get her back into court and get her case re-looked at. But of course, like everything in this world, it comes down to money. All of the inmates that I talk to are unable to finance their own personal private lawyers and rely on either themselves fighting their own cases or public defenders who we already know have an extremely heavy workload. 
One such person will feature in the next episode of One Minute Remaining. Hello, this is a prepaid call from David Talley, an inmate at a Florida Department of Corrections institution. David Talley is not a man who claims to be innocent. He's also not a man who's killed anyone or even been accused of killing anyone. He's not even a man who's hurt anyone, but he is a man who is serving an incredible sentence. An aggregate sentence of 100 years with all the sentences running consecutive. Next time on One Minute Remaining. One Minute Remaining is a Mash Pumpkin production. Hosted and produced by Jack Lawrence. Editing and sound design by Jack Lawrence and Dom Evans. This podcast is part of the ACAST Creator Network.